uh, changing from, uh, you know, uh, in the HIV STI Bureau funding syringe exchange programs, largely based on their ability to do HIV screening for individuals who inject drugs to what we're moving toward, which what we're going to be doing beginning in 2019, which is like, here's a bunch of money, do a bunch of cool stuff with people who use drugs, whether they inject or use some other route of administration. Is it HIV? Is it HCV? Is it overdose? Is it trauma-informed treatment? Is it food distribution? Is it legal support? Is it any of these things? Go for it. Just basically looking at, a, a, at how we can provide supports for organizations and programs to be what the client needs, what the community needs, rather than uh, what our funders are asking us for. Um, and I think along, it, it's important to explicitly state that that's what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's part of the institutionalizing, making a statement that we believe that the public health benefit of these services is greater if we are allowing for an unsiloed funding opportunity for a organization that is providing a range of services for folks. Hi, Patrick. This is Caitlin from Philadelphia. I really um, couldn't agree more with you. I'm curious um, not uh, to kind of um, I couldn't agree more with you, and I'm also curious whose money you're using to do that. Yeah, of course, that's the important thing, right? So uh, what we're currently doing is, uh, well, we've, we've actually never used, uh, obviously we can't use uh, CDC dollars for uh, syringe exchange programs. So we've been using City of Chicago uh, funds uh, to provide those services, and we've been able to uh, gather some other funds from other organizations and national funding that had been going toward behavioral health services, uh, overdose prevention activities, and we're working, we have been working on putting all of those together into a single funding opportunity. So it'd be City of Chicago, some national funding, uh, and looking at some other private foundation uh, funding opportunities so that we can pull a bunch of resources together, each one that has certain restrictions and certain allowed expenses, putting that all together and having it be uh, sort of a pick and choose as you need for the services that you're providing. Great, thank you. All right, any other thoughts before we move on to the next question? Okay. I mean, um, I mean I, this, this is Patrick again. Okay. I got more ideas, like if, if no one else does. I mean, some of the things that, I mean, we're, we're talking about how do we better, similar to what was discussed with Philadelphia and New York, how do we uh, involve ourselves in the health department in some of the the community organizing that's been done uh, in a way that's not co-opting those activities or co-opting the mobilization that those organizations and individuals and community members have done. How do we, uh, and this is an important, again, having to be really forthright and open about it, that we don't want to take control on, of things. We want to participate and we want to do everything that we can to support existing things, bringing resources, bringing you know, whatever level of weight uh, uh, and legitimacy comes with being a health department partner while making sure that doing so is not getting in the way of the effectiveness of the work that is being done by non-health department community members and community partners. Uh, so really, how do we uh, feel, how do we fill gaps that exist that are being uh, expressed to us by our community partners who are more nimble in terms of being able to act on our, around active substance use, of being able to act in terms of advocacy for uh, safer use facilities. Um, so really being uh, very intimate and open with our community partners about what, what we can and what we cannot do and letting them tell us where they need us to shut up and get out of the way and where they need us to be present and back them up in things. And being really humble and that that is our role with it. Um, so in institutionalizing it in that we're you know, engaging in a lot of conversations around the different programs within the health department about how each one of us have done such things in the past. So connecting behavioral health, substance use, HIV, hepatitis C, and some other elements like how do we 
how have each of these different programs successfully or not successfully engaged in that kind of an interaction with a community partner um, and, and have that be sort of the guiding principles around what we as the health department are going to be doing moving forward when we're talking about working with an or, uh, organizations and populations that are so uh, that are legally ostracized in a way that some of our other populations and communities are not. Hi, this is Alex in Philly, and, and I agree with that point about engaging with the community organizing without co-opting it. I mean, and also just as health department officials, you know, we can only go so far with our advocacy. Um, and so I think that the one way, we, one resource we have that I think we can always do a better job of sharing is providing our community partners with the data they need to help advocate making sure they know where to access some of our data that will help them advocate for um, more resources to address drug user health. I mean, we post our reports online and have some of our information publicly available, but I think that there are ways that we can um, break our data down or share it so that they can use it for their advocacy efforts um, and use it in a way that we don't always have the, the ability to use it for. Um, and this is also Caitlin um, from Philadelphia. I think circling back and just to um, do kind of an internal evaluation, uh, particularly when um, you and your department, uh, I think that at least in Philadelphia, um, rates of new diagnoses among um, people who inject drugs are, are continually trending downward. And I think it's um, for us, that's a really positive advancement in that uh, population. Uh, it's also really important to kind of not um, let that be something that allows us to kind of like rest on our laurels. And so one of the things that we've been doing is kind of um, some internal evaluations and surveys with our um, uh, partner services staff um, and kind of also taking stock of our uh, training um, and doing kind of an assessment of where are there gaps and opportunities to include more um, drug user health and kind of seeing you know where um, hep C comes up and doesn't come up um, and I think that what we found is there's a lot of room to um, continually um, address drug user health and we've been doing some things really well um, and there's also a lot of opportunities to continually um, uh, improve on that and so I think that it's uh, there's kind of a, a thing that we don't want to kind of create internal competition among populations um, for time and space and resources uh, and so how do we balance that um, uh, as a department and so we've been doing a little bit of that as well. Okay. Um, if there's a bit more to add related to funding, we can move on to the second question. How, has, how, have, how can funding decisions advance our efforts to improve drug user health? All right. Any thoughts related to how um, you guys fund your programs, sustain the programs, maybe even start up in terms of some of your more innovative programming? Uh, this is Patrick from Chicago again. One thing that I've, I've seen that, that hasn't been implemented in, in HIV, STI Bureau, uh, funding yet, but uh, that I've seen in another program at the health department was uh, have uh, a weighted scored question in the funding application related to uh, organizations' commitment to improving drug user health writ large, including uh, the ability to hire not uh, as temporary staff, but as you know, full-on program staff, people who either are currently or former substance users, regardless of whether or not they had any kind of criminal record related to that. And while I think that that definitely restricted uh, 
the number of applicants that that particular program uh, received that had you know, like solid scores all the way across their applications. It was a really important question to be able to ask and to look at and ask ourselves, but then also sh uh, ask of the applications if we are going to be adding uh, questions related to you know uh, providing service. If the fund, the purpose of the funding is to be able to provide services for the overall health of human beings who happen to be individuals who either currently or formerly use drugs, then adding in questions into those funding opportunities and, the, and by weighting those questions, uh, adding it into the funding decisions that people who are either currently or former substance users are human beings who are eligible for employment and are peers and members of the communities that we're providing services to in the same way that we would say, uh, we would uh, ask that question related to uh, gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men, transgender individuals. they like, no, you should be, you know, we want to be able to give you extra points on this if you're hiring people who are of this population. And that that was a really like a big deal for us to say like no we're we're putting it in and it's going through the procurement process and our legal department is approving that we can add points to an application if they say yeah we will hire people who have criminal records or related to substance use or other things or people who are openly currently using drugs we're like that's actually pretty awesome. Um. Okay, thank you. That's a fantastic example. Um, any others? Um, if you haven't implemented anything yet, are there some things that you're thinking about that you're considering? Okay, um, so we'll move on. How can our partnerships and community outreach efforts uh, help advance drug user health? Um, we've mentioned a few throughout the meeting, but are there um, any others from New York, San Francisco, who would like to share their experiences? Broward County? Okay, I know this is not a shy group. Go ahead. <laughs> no, this Ben, it's like nothing more to share from New York. The, um, aside from what Gail has presented. Okay. Anything else from the others in the group? Um, you maybe want to share some things that you have done um, in relation to your partnerships with communities. I read this is uh, Thomas Noble from San Francisco. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Oh, excellent. Um, hi, uh, those of you, I haven't met most of you. So my name is Thomas Noble, and I'm uh, taking over the position that Jose Luis um, was currently in. Um, I was a uh, supervisor, so. Um, but I was just thinking about the uh, police connection with regards to working with the SFPD and that um, we do what we call roll call trainings uh, where we step in and um, before they go out on their shifts, we'll uh, talk to them about issues that are related to either the syringe sites or a needle sticks or something along those lines. And it's been very helpful in creating a healthy partnership. So when they are working with individuals that there's uh, less stigma and a little bit more understanding of um, what the issues are related in the field. Um, we found when we've kind of had the community-based organizations fulfilling that role, um, the activism energy kind of was a little challenging for the uh, officers to kind of hear the messaging. So um, having DPH employees 
who could act as a liaison between those two worlds has really been um, helpful in creating a healthy partnership with those folks. Okay, any other thoughts? Hi, I think this is Caitlin from Philadelphia. I think, um, you know, one of the things, and I know Alex touched on this, like we've really, um, are implementing uh, to some extent some some really grassroots strategies at the health department. So our harm reduction coordinator, um, Allison Hearns, is working um, very closely with the medical examiner's offices and hospitals who are sending overdose reports um, to issue health alerts. And a recent example is there's been an increase of fentanyl in the crack supply at, at near um, one of the West Philadelphia hospitals. Um, and it resulted in a number of fatal overdoses and non-fatal overdoses. Um, and you know that really resulted in her and her team going out and um, really canvassing that neighborhood um, with um, information on uh, fentanyl and resulted in naloxone trainings in that neighborhood and really going and doing one-on-one -on -one conversations with business owners um, in that neighborhood and also um, folks uh, just on street corners um, and who are hanging out in the neighborhood, I think to kind of do um, kind of information one-on-one -on -one around um, what is fentanyl and you know where it kind of is and how it can be in other drugs. And so, you know, I know New York touched on that um, with uh, their firing, but it's been really effective um, to increase public knowledge. Um, and I think that kind of looking at what has worked in the past and really bringing those strategies forward uh, has been something that we found uh, in terms of partnerships and community outreach has worked quite well. This is Erin from uh, Portland, Oregon. And we've been doing some similar work. We're still sort of at the beginning of it, um, but we've worked with our medical examiner and data from ER and our EMS and also our neighboring counties to put together an overdose surveillance. And our hope is that in the future, we're gonna be able to, um, we're forming our communication plan. And in the future, we're gonna be able to sort of be at the front end of things um, so that we can warn people and do that similar work um, that you're talking about. Um, we haven't seen the huge increase in fentanyl that's been seen on the East Coast, but we are trying to sort of plan ahead for that um, and work with um, and, and use sort of this, the conversation of the overdose surveillance to work with um, EMS law enforcement and other organizations to create a plan so that when fentanyl does hit us, we're not caught off guard and we can move quickly to try and reduce the amount of deaths associated with it. Okay, does anyone else have anything they wanna to add to this question? Okay, we can move on to the next one. Um, how can we engage and balance both community and technical expertise in our prevention efforts? Um, this is Alex in Philly. I think that a role that health departments can really help play is um, you know, looking at who the experts in our communities are and kind of empowering providers to share their best practices with other providers and in doing so, hopefully building enthusiasm to be expanding on the best practices that exist. Um, I, when I've gone out to do clinical site visits, um, something I started asking in addition to my questions about what hepatitis services they're providing is, you know, what sort of harm reduction services are you providing? Are you referring folks to Prevention Point, our surgery change program? Are you prescribing the loss loan? And I think that, you know, prescribing the loss loan is something HIV providers, you know, that's like a, kind of a low hanging fruit that they can do, but not everyone is really understanding that. Um, 
you know, that's a role that they can play in addressing drug user health. But we have some sites that have made it a priority to make sure all of their clients get a Narcan prescription. So I think just figuring out ways that we can highlight the best practices that are happening um, and to try to encourage or stimulate other practices to maybe start applying um, similar initiatives in their setting. Um, especially, I think, thinking about what can be done without additional grant funding or resources to give, but how they can maybe use their existing infrastructure to, to integrate um, services uh, around drug use or health. Yeah. Uh, Greg Sini, Philadelphia. Uh, so I think that planning bodies, the Ryan White CDC and Grady Planning Bodies actually uh, are a great forum for information exchange between providers and, you know, government, what's happening. Uh, I just wanted to add that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right, so moving on to the last question. What would be our next steps, like um, as a group or individually within your own health departments? What steps would you like to take next? All right, maybe um, from some others we haven't heard from, do you want to take a moment to um, share your thoughts with the group, um, some next steps that you can take to um, solidify your commitment to improving drug user health within the health department? Um, how about Alejandro, Zina, Aaron? Are there any uh, last thoughts you want to share with us before we move on? So this is Aaron again from Multnomah County in Portland. Um, like I talked about earlier, our next steps are really figuring out how um, do we track possible spikes in overdoses and then the big question is how do we then figure out what drug may be causing the overdose? So we, our medical examiner is about six months behind generally in um, death data. And so if anyone has any great ideas in ways that they have, um, I mean, I know we have the use of fentanyl test strips, but in general kind of figuring out what may be in um, a batch of heroin or what if it's not heroin, what drug could be causing a spike in overdoses that we're seeing so that our messaging can be um, less generic and more very focused on we kn what we know is happening. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. Any, any other thoughts? Hi, this is Zena. Um, when we talk about next steps, is there a way where we could also emphasize on more social determinants of health? I heard that we talked about it, but is there any way we can really start incorporating those services? Because what I'm seeing is Georgia, we're still breaking human beings up by their um, diagnosis and their health disparities. Were you able to hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think as a group, UCHOPS, uh, that is something that we're working towards, even as we are, um, begin to write the next version of the Urban Health Agenda, uh, fo focusing more on uh, social determinants of health and making sure that's a solid part of our plan going forward. Good. Um, any other health departments? 
focusing on uh, social determinants of health or ways that you are focusing on that work? So this is Erin again in Portland. We're really trying to figure out how we show that homelessness, because um, we have a pretty large um, houseless population, how that is a social determinant of health and how we can kind of use that to show how needle exchange and syringe exchange services are a way um, to bridge those people into uh, primary care services and getting regular health care, but we haven't quite figured out how to kind of show that and prove that yet. Hi, this is Zena. One of the ways that we are doing it um, at Anis is that we actually do clean syringe access. So because it's not exchange is not legal in Georgia. So once we do that, we do before the, our uh, members actually get the syringes, we do a, um, a, a mini biopsychosocial assessment. And with that cycle assessment, we are able to connect social determinants of health and actually able to give them, gear them to what particular programs they need. So, and just doing clean syringe exchange, we're actually doing a holistic approach and looking at all of those other barriers they might be encountering before they actually get the syringes. So that's kind of how we are looking at using as a social determinant of health. So if they're HIV positive, refer them to um, Ryan White. If they're doing high risk behaviors um, as for sex trafficking and doing those things, then we actually refer them to our collab departments. But our niece is a foundation where we actually do, uh, like I said, a clear psychosocial assessment. So we're looking at all the gaps in services and what are their immediate needs prior to giving them the syringes. Do you feel like that causes any barriers um, to people accessing services just because of having to kind of go through and disclose a lot of stuff that they might not otherwise have disclosed? Mm, well, it's, it's a real mini psychosocial. I don't have a problem sharing it. So it's a really mini psychosocial assessment. And once they do that psychosocial assessment, then they only have to do it once. So it's not mandatory that they get those um, services, but when they come into the office, by us being a mental health facility, we just felt that we need to do more than just doing clean syringes. And what we realized that more people come in and ask for additional services, like we, um, every week we do food stamps, um, we do Medicaid, we have a clinic, we have a pharmacy. So we have a lot of services that they are able to get, but they have to become a member. So we are, that's not really a gap. They actually like the idea that they're not just getting syringes, that they're actually coming into an environment to get additional service. Yeah, if you were willing to share that, I'd love to see it. This is Erin again in Portland. <laughs> yes, I don't have a problem saying that to you. So I don't know how we could get emails or if you would like for me to send it to everyone. But um, we wanted to look at not just having a niece where it was just clean syringe. And one of the things that we also do, we have it as a, um, a drop-off site where they can actually drop off um, dirty syringes. So we have it as a, um, a site where they could drop dirty syringes without asking any questions. So that avoids the liability where we are not actually touching the syringes, they're coming in and dropping off the syringes. Because one of the issues that we were having is that we were passing out syringes and didn't have nothing set up to collect the syringes. So we just made it a, um, a drop-off site location. Like when they drop off meds, they can actually drop off the syringes at our location. And we're getting a lot of members using that philosophy. And we don't um, actually call our, um, I'm sorry. What was your question? I'm sorry. Um, Zena, this is Ivory from UCHAPS. If you like, you can just email me the information and I'll send it out to the group. My email address is ivory at uchaps.org. And I can send that out. Okay, cool. Okay, anything else from the group in terms of next steps, things you might like to address? Okay, um, <laughs> within a a few seconds, just give us one minute. We're gonna close the breakout groups and that will move everyone back into the main room. So just give us um, a second to do that. The other breakout session is wrapping up and then we'll close the breakout sessions and move back into the main room for the report out session. 
and we'll hear what um, community had to say about these questions. And we'll be moving back into the main room in one second. <laughs> 